Sutra. Some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through mantras and prohibitions. When they have perfected these self spells and dharmas, they are known as immortals with way conduct. Commentary: These beings have a firm determination to recite mantras. The Tibetan lamas are an example of this category, provided that they perfect their skills. Some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through mantras and prohibitions. They recite mantras and always hold prohibitive precepts. When they have perfected these spells and dharmas, they are known as immortals with way conduct. Sutra. Some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through the, the use of thought processes. When they have perfected thought and memory, they are known as immortals with illumining conduct. Com commentary. Some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through the use of thought processes. They turn their determination to their thoughts without resting. They develop total thought. When they have perfected thought and memory, they are known as immortals with illumining conduct. When they perfect this practice, they have a bit of light. In their thoughts, they imagine that they are transformed into golden light. When they cherish this thought for a long time, eventually it's just like the old mother hen on her eggs or the cat stalking the mouse. There are some success. That's why they are called immortals with illumining conduct. They have some light. Sutra, some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through intercourse. When they have perfected the response, they are known as immortals with essential conduct. Commentary, usually intercourse refers to the sexual act between men and women, but that is definitely not the meaning here. Rather, the intercourse takes place within him oneself. The Taoists call this the young boy and girl. Each individual is capable of it. It's not a matter of seeking outside oneself. Everyone has a young boy and girl in his or her own body. The young boy refers to the chakra Li, and the young girl refers to the chakra Kan. This is an allusion to the trigrams. The chakra Li is empty in the middle. The chakra Kan is full in the middle. The eight trigrams are Qian, Li, Quan. Kan, Chen, Dui, Gen, Sun, Sun. They begin with the chagram Qian, which consists of the three unbroken lines. Qian represents the male element. Quan is three broken lines and represents the female element. At age 36, a man's Chen chagram is at its peak. Thereafter, it will decline and it turns into the trigram Li. The Li trigram has two outer yang lines and an inner yin line. Where did the yang line from the middle of the Li go? It went over to the Quan trigram, which subsequently turns into Kan, which consists of two yin outer lines with a middle yang line. The Li Chagram belongs to the mind and the Khan Chagram belongs to the body. So the intercourse referred to in this passage is the intercourse of body and mind as, this, as described here. The intercourse is simply an analogy for an, a union of body and mind. The entire process takes place in one individual's body. The Li Chagram belongs to Yang, but within the Yang is Yin. The Khan Chagram belongs to Yin, but within the Yin is Yang. The infant boy and girl meet at the yellow courtyard. What is the yellow courtyard? courtyard? It's the mind, the sixth consciousness. And the mind belongs to the hexagram P. It would get tremendously involved if we were to go into this doctrine in detail. 
Tom simply does not permit me to explain it further. In any event, the Taoists cultivate the Dhamma draw of this kind of intercourse. When people with Devon knowledge and Devon views see this passage of the Suragama Sutra, they surmise that it says it's all right for men and women to mess around together, that cultivators of the way can get away with that. So they get all mixed up together and don't hold the precepts at all. Sutra. Some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through transformations and changes. When they have perfected their awakening, they are known as immortals of absolute conduct. Commentary. Some beings with unflagging resolution make themselves strong through transformations and changes. Here it says that with a firm resolve, a cultivator investigates various kinds of Dharma destiny tricks. When he succeeded in developing them, he has some ability to function by means of them. Then his skill of cultivation is perfected. When they have perfected their awakening, they are known as immortals of absolute conduct. They understand the doctrine of creation. This kind of immortal can move mountains and turn over seas. It's possible for them to exchange the mountains in the north for the mountains in the south. They can move the seas around to the same way, replacing the ocean in the west with the ocean in the east and vice versa. They have the power to change the seasons. For example, when it's cold in the winter so that things won't grow. They can make it so that the things they have planted will grow and won't freeze. They can make the hottest places cold and the cold, coldest places warm. They can turn spring into winter and summer into winter at will. They can turn spring when things should be blossoming in, into autumn when things are dying. How can they do it? They have fathomed the doctrine of creation of heaven and earth and they can function by means of that understanding. They become capable of creation itself. They are called immortals of absolute conduct. Sutra Ananda, these are all people who smelt their minds but do not cultivate proper enlightenment. They obtain some special principle of life and can live for thousands or tens of thousands of years. They retire deep into the mountains or onto islands in the sea but cut, cut themselves off from the human realm. However, they are still part of the turning wheel because they fall and turn according to their false thinking and do not cultivate somebody. When their reward is finished, they must still return and enter the various destinies. Commentary Ananda, these are all people who smelt their minds but do not cultivate proper enlightenment. When they were pupil, they smelted their bodies and minds. They did not cultivate the Suragama Samadhi of the treasury of the first come one, which is neither produced nor extinguished. They didn't cultivate proper enlightenment. They obtain some special principle of life and can live for thousands of tens of thousands of years. The various Dharma doors described above are all ways they found which could extend the measure of their lifespans. The gods of the externalist paths transmitted to them these externalist dramas which preserve life, so they have very long lifespans. They retire deep into the mountains or onto islands in the sea and cut themselves off from the human realm. They go to places where people cannot go. There is a Mount Sumeru in this world system and surrounding it are seven golden mountains and seven seas of fragrant waters. Out beyond the, those mountains and seas there is a vast expanse of soft water. This water is such that if a bird's feather lands on the surface, it will sink to the bottom. The feather would float on ordinary water, but this water is so soft that it does not have the power to support anything on its surface. Obviously, if a bird's feather sinks, any other thing like a boat or raft would certainly sink too. 
only flying immortals can cross it. So these people who cultivate and become immortals fly over this water to isolated islands where people can never go. However, they are still part of the turning wheel because they flow and turn according to their false thinking and do not cultivate somebody. Although they may live for thousands of years, they are still within the cycle of rebirth. They have not been able to end birth and death entirely. The reason they still must transmigrate is because they still have things they are attached to. Specifically, they want immortality. They want to live long and not grow old. That's their false thinking and so they don't cultivate proper concentration power. When their reward is finished, they must still return and enter the various destinies. When their lifespan finally ends, they will go to rebirth and they might become people or asuras or gods, or they might end up in the house or as hungry ghosts or animals. It's not for sure where they end up. Sutra Ananda, there are many people in the world who do not seek what is eternal and who cannot yet renounce the kindness and love they feel for their wives. Commentary Ananda, there are many people in the world who do not seek what is eternal. This can mean that they do not seek the eternally abide in the world and it can also mean that they do not seek the internally abiding nature of the true mind. They cannot yet renounce the kindness and love they feel for their wives. Sutra, but they have no interest in devin sexual activity and so develop a purity and produce light. When their life ends, they draw near the sun and moon and are among those born in the heaven of the four kings. Commentary But they have no interest in Devin's sexual activity. Having sexual activity with someone other than one's spouse is called Devin. That which occurs within the marriage is not considered to be lost and is not Devin. However, it is better to be sparing about such activity even in marriage. It should not be excessive. When you cultivate the way, no matter how much merit and virtue you may have, you must not engage in devant lustful activity. If you cultivate but cannot cut off such activity, when, then you won't be successful no matter how hard you work at cultivation. These people being discussed in the text here are not interested in devant lust and so develop a purity and produce light. If one does not pursue lustful activity. One will be pure and out of that purity will come light, the natural light of virtue. So it is said, oh, of all the myriad evils, lust is the foremost. Don't go down that road to death. If one does not engage in death and lust, then one's sense, breath and spirit will be full and complete. From that fullness comes the virtuous light. During one's life, one will glow and radiate with light. When their life ends, they draw near the sun and moon and are among those born in the heaven of the four kings. This kind of rebirth includes a lot of people. One knows not how many people fit this category. The heaven of the four kings is located halfway up Mount Sumeru. It is the heaven closest to our human realm. The gods in this heaven have a lifespan of 500 years. One day and night in that heaven is equivalent to 50 years in the human realm. So their lifespan is 9 million years if calculated according to our time. Sutra, those who, whose sexual love for their wives is light, but who have not yet obtained the entire flavor of dwelling in purity, transcend the light of sun and moon at the end of their lives, and reside at the summit of the human realm. They are among those born in the Chayashimsha heaven. 
commentary, those whose sexual love for their wives is light, but who have not yet obtained the entire flavor of dwelling in purity, transcend the light of sun and moon at the end of their lives. Those born in the heaven of the four kings did not engage in daring sex, but had not managed to decrease their involvement with their own wives. However, they remained faithful to their wives and did not get involved with any other woman. The same holds true for women. They did not get involved with any man other than their own husbands. Beings born in the heaven of the four kings did not have lovers when they were in the human realm. Now the text discusses people who have decreased their sexual activity within the marriage. It can apply either to wives with regard to their husbands or husbands with regard to their wives. Slight means that they very, very seldom engaged in this practice. They might not get involved with one another even once in a year or they might go for several years getting involved by once. They do not look upon sexual activity as important. Why do some people have such heavy sexual desire? It's because of the heaviness of their comic obstacles. Someone with few comic obstacles, however, will not have such thoughts. Heavy comic obstacles push your pupil and cause them to think of nothing else but sex from morning till night. Such thoughts never stop. But it's just in the midst of such heavy comic obstacles that you should wake up and realize that you should decrease your comic obstacles. If you simply go along with your comic obstacles, then the further you go, the further you fall. In the future, it's not for certain you will become a cow, a horse, or pig, or a dog. And this kind of rebirth will go on and on without cease. Why? Because your emotional desire is too heavy, it will certainly cause you to fall. It's very dangerous. Although the people discussed in this passage of text have very little regard for sexual activity, they still have not obtained the entire flavor of dwelling in purity. They have not gained genuine purity and its advantages because they don't know how to cultivate at the end of their lives, then, they will transcend the light of sun and moon and reside at the summit of the human realm. Because they don't have much emotional desire, the light of their self-nature comes forth. Anyone who does not have emotional desire will have light and will be able to be reborn in the heavens. These people are among those born in the Chajashimsha heaven. Chajashimsha heaven. Uh, Chajashimsha is Sanskrit and means heaven of the 33. The Lord of the heaven of the 33 resides above our heads. There are eight heavens in the east, eight in the west, eight in the north, and eight in the south, making 32. The 33rd is located among the others in the center and is at the peak of Mount Sumeru. How did the Lord of the heaven of the 33 get reborn there? Originally, she was a poor woman who saw a stupa which was falling apart. She resolved to repair it and set about begging and working to make the money to do it. Meanwhile, she got together with 32 friends. They had a meeting and decided to repair the stupa with their combined efforts. After they died, the 32 became lots of the accompanying heavens and the woman became the lot of the 33rd heaven. The last band of the gods in the heaven of the 33 is a thousand years. A hundred years of human time makes up one day and night in, uh, in that heaven. As we progress upwards, the inhabitants of each higher heaven have a lifespan double that of the heaven below. The highs of the gods also increase proportionately, but it's rather tedious to go into all that. And so, if you want to know about it in detail, you can investigate it on your own. Sutra, those who become temporarily involved when they meet with their desire, but who forget about it when it is finished, and who while in the human realm are active less and 
acquired more abide at the end of their lives in light and emptiness where the illumination of sun and moon does not reach these beings have their own light and they are among those born in the suyama heaven commentary there is a certain category of people in the world who become temporarily involved when they meet with desire but who forget about it when it is finished this refers to the activity of married couples although occasionally they engage in sexual intercourse these people forget about it when it's gone by they don't think about it afterwards while they are in the human realm are active less and quiet more that means they spend the greater part of their time practicing transamadhi they will abide at the end of their lives in light and emptiness where the illumination of sun and moon does not reach the light of the sun and moon do not shine where these people go these beings have their own light when they reach that place in emptiness their own bodies emit an everlasting light and so at that place there is no day and night it's always light there how then do they reckon the passage of time they use the lotus flower when the flower opens they know it is day when the flower closes it is night these beings are among those born in the suyama heaven their average height is 225 feet their lifespan is 2000 of their years suyama means well divided time because it's always light there day and night sutra those who are quiet all the time but who are not yet able to resist when stimulated by contact ascend at the end of their lives to a subtle and ethereal place they will not be drawn into the lower realms the destruction of the realms of humans and gods and the obliteration of compass by the three disasters will not reach them for they are among those born in the tushita heaven commentary in this heaven there is an inner and an outer court in the outer court the common gods will dwell and in the inner court the sages dwell at present maitreya bodhisattva dwells in the inner court of the tushita heaven he is explaining about the samadhi of mind consciousness only those who are quiet all the time but who are not yet able to resist when stimulated by contact the center at the end of their lives to a subtle and ethereal place they will not be drawn into the lower realms at all times and in all situations they never move they are very tranquil however when an occasion arises for sexual intercourse it's not for certain that they will not get involved but they don't really want to get involved they may occasionally indulge in this activity but very very rarely at death these people who have few desires and are content will ascend their souls will go to a subtle and ethereal place and will not fall down the destruction of the realms of humans and gods and the obliteration of compass by the three disasters will not reach them for they are among those born in the tushita heaven the three disasters are the disaster of fire the disaster of water the disaster of wind fire burns through the first jhana water drowns the second jhana and wind devastates the third jhana but because bodhisattvas reside in this tushita heaven the three disasters cannot reach it tushita means having few desires and being content they simply don't have any greed they are avoid devoid of sexual desire so if you want to get reborn in the heavens just have few desires and be content to have strong emotions and so forever be thinking of that kind of thing never being able to put it down for even an instant so that's very dangerous indeed it is in fact the most perilous matter of all it is the source of one's fall if you don't feel the fall then 
think about that kind of stuff as much as you want. If you are afraid of falling, then quickly stop those emotional thoughts. If you don't stop, there's no telling where you'll end up in the future. Sutra, those who are devoid of desire but who will engage in it for the sake of their partner, even though the flavor of doing so is like the flavor of chewing wax, are born at the end of their lives in a place of transcending transformations. They are among those born in the heaven of bliss by transformation. Commentary, those who are devoid of desire but who will engage in it for the sake of their partner. Even though the flavor of doing so is like the flavor of chewing wax, are born at the end of their lives in a place of transcending transformations. I don't have any desire at all, but you persist. You insist we do this thing. That's what transpires between couples where one partner is devoid of sexual desire while the other isn't. The one will The one with the desire pursues the one without desire. Have you ever chewed wax? Well, you can chew forever, but you'll never get any taste from it. That's the analogy used to indicate that this kind of person gets no pleasure out of sex. They just don't have any thoughts of lust. After hearing this principle, you should certainly take care to control yourself. Don't be loose anymore. Don't run headlong down the road to death. The rebirth of the Kaiser beings discussed here transcends those of the heavens discussed earlier. They are among those born in the heaven of bliss by transformation. Everything in their environment is transformed. It is an extremely blissful place, unspeakably joyous. But the bliss referred to is not like that of ordinary sexual involvement it is a natural natural bliss however it is not an ultimate place of rebirth it is still within the six desire heavens the gods in this heaven are three thousand and seventy five feet tall one day and night in that heaven is equal to eight hundred years among pupils and their lifespan is eight thousand of their years Sutra, those who have no kind of worldly thoughts while doing that worldly people do, who are lucid and beyond such activity while involved in it, are capable at the end of their lives of entirely transcending states where transformations may be present and may be lacking. They are among those born in the heaven of the comfort from others' transformations. Commentary. Those who have no kind of worldly thoughts of sexual desire while doing what worldly people do, who are lucid and beyond such activity while involved in it. These are people who occasionally involve themselves in intercourse with their marriage partner. But for them, not only does it have the flavor of wax, it's as if nothing were happening at all. They are capable at the end of their lives of entirely transcending states where transformations may be present and may be lacking. They reach a state where they can go out of their bodies and transform as they please endlessly. They are among those born in the heaven of the comfort from others' transformations. Everything in the environment of the heaven those beings go to does not originate there but is rather a transformation made as an offering by beings in other heavens. It is extremely comfortable there. The bliss is vast and there's no work to be done. There aren't any servants in that heaven. People who work for a living would starve there because everything happens naturally and spontaneously. The bliss is extreme. It is a lot better than the human realm, that's for sure. But even though it's such a fine place, the beings there will nevertheless fall one day. Once they use up their heavenly blessings, they will fall back to the human realm and even into their house, there's nothing fixed about it. Those heavenly beings are an average of 4,500 feet tall. One day and night in that heaven is equal to 1,500 years on earth, and 
their lifespan is 16,000 of their years. Those then are the six desire heavens. All of the beings in those heavens still have sexual desire in varying degrees. The verse describes it. In the heaven of the four kings and the Chajachimsha, desire is carried out through embracing. In the Suryama heaven, they hold hands. In the Tushita, they smile. In the bliss of transformation, they gaze. In the comfort from others, a glance will do. In the six desire heavens, this is the bliss they take to be true. In the heaven of the four kings and the Chajachimsha, desire is carried out through embracing. They conduct sexual affairs the same way people do. In the Suryama heaven, they hold hands. In the Tushita, they smile. The beings in the Suryama heaven unite in mind but not physically. All they have to do to fulfill their sexual longing is to hold hands. In the Tushita heaven, they smile. There's no physical contact involved. In the bliss of transformation, they gaze. In the comfort from others, a glance will do. Men and women in the bliss by transformation heaven need only look at one another. They don't even have to smile. They stare at each other for maybe three minutes or five minutes. That's how their sexual intercourse is completed. In the next heaven, a brief glance is sufficient. An instant is all it takes. The higher the heaven, the lighter the thoughts of sexual desire. This is a true principle. You should understand it clearly. Once you do, you'll be able to genuinely understand the Buddha Dharma. For you will know that sexual desire is tremendously harmful. Do you remember the earlier passage in the sutra that says, Bodhisattvas look upon sexual desire as they would a poisonous snake? They know they will be beaten to death. People's ordinary flesh eyes cannot see how fierce it is. That's why they spend all their time, day and night, thinking about this nasty thing. They can't put it down. If you really understood, I think you wouldn't be so confused and upside down about it. Sutra Ananda says it is that although they have transcended the physical in these six heavens, the traces of their minds still become involved, for that they will have to pay in person. These are called the six desire heavens. Commentary Ananda says it is that although they have transcended the physical in these six heavens, the traces of their minds still become involved. Although they have transcended the physical plane, they still get hung up mentally. Their minds, natures, and bodies still act out thoughts of sexual desire. For that, they will have to pay in person. These are called the six desire heavens. These heavens from the heaven of the four kings to the heaven of comfort from others. Transformations are called the six desire heavens. The heavens are still in the desire realm because the beings in them are not totally pure. They still have thoughts of sexual desire. Sutra Ananda, all those in the world who cultivate their minds but do not avail themselves of jhana and so have no wisdom, can only control their bodies so as to not engage in sexual desire. Whether walking or sitting or in their thoughts, they are totally devoid of it. Since they do not give rise to defiling love, they do not remain in the realm of desire. These people can, in response to their thought, take on the bodies of Brahma beings. They are among those in the heaven of the multitudes of Brahma. Commentary Ananda Now we will talk about the form realm, the heavens of the four dhyanas. All those in the world who cultivate their minds but do not avail themselves of dhyana and so have no wisdom, can only control their bodies so as to not engage in sexual desire. They haven't become skilled in the practice of dhyana of stealing their thoughts, and so they don't have any genuine wisdom. What they can do is control their own bodies and refrain from engaging in lust. Whether walking or sitting or in their thoughts, they are totally devoid of it. Walking, standing, sitting, and lying down, even in their sleep at all times, 
and in all places they do not give rise to defining love. No matter how beautiful an object of form they may see, they do not give rise to defining thoughts of love, and so they do not remain in the realm of design. These people can, in response to their thought, take on the bodies of Brahma beings. They join with other pure beings. None of them have any desire. They are among those in the heaven of the mantitos of Brahma. They become part of the pure beings who inhabit this heaven, which is a part of that general heavenly mantitos, one among many.